HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film. Powder donut. <clears throat> Okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The Name Your Price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast continues to enjoy inclusion on lists of the best podcasts to listen to. Most recently, we were named um, to the list of 12 business podcasts that uh, people should be listening to uh, by Jerry Detweiler on allbusiness.com. And this is really because of the guests who join me here to have a conversation uh, where they share their expertise with you, the listeners, so that you can get um, the information that you need to do better things in your business. Today is no different. My guest today is Mario Knopfel. Mario is the founder of Athena Group of Companies, a business conglomerate operating in more than 40 countries. He had bootstrapped his first business at the age of 22 with $300 in his bank account selling blenders door-to-door, which led to Fruity, Australia. He made his first million in one year and eight figures by year two. Mario has since then scaled to over 30 countries and launched many other companies, including a consulting business bootstrapped to seven figures in less than six months. Mario has been through extremely difficult black swan events that would break down any entrepreneur and bankrupt a business. He is now bootstrapping another seven-figure business and documenting the entire process from the beginning to allow entrepreneurs full access to all marketing, logistics, product, operational, and financial decisions 
including both failures and successes. Thanks so much for joining me today, Marielle. Not at all. I'll also help you plug Audible because I'm a fan of Audible. I was actually listening to Audible before this interview and I paused it to join you on this call. So I'm a big fan of Audible. I'm glad they sponsored oh, this. Oh, that's show. great. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I know. Me too. I think it's just an incredible, yes. uh, incredible platform. So thank you for doing Thanks that. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, so when, when it, you know, we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, the ups and downs of, of uh, being an entrepreneur and building a business. But I am curious, when it comes to building a successful business, are there certain like golden rules that people need to follow? I wouldn't call them golden rules. There's, you could say, yes, there is. Don't run out of money. That's number one. But even that, businesses are breaking that rule as well and they're being funded by uh, uh, VCs. But yeah, don't run out of money. Um, on, other than that, I really can't think of any other rules as such because everything can be bent. And, um, yeah. and, and it varies depending on the industry, the time, um, the circumstances. And that's why I'm, I can be very critical sometimes of the advice given by a lot of these um, business gurus and influencers. Some of it is great and some of them are really smart and I listen to them. I like to learn from everyone. I just think that it's wrong to give rules to their audience. And they're like, they like to do that to get followers and likes, etc. But it, it could be very misleading. And sometimes that advice does not apply to a business and could harm the business. So I think when giving advice, um, giving rules should not be the case. You give advice and then you tell the person that, that's receiving the advice that could work for you, but you have to you know, look at your circumstances, your business, um, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree with you. And I'm so glad that you said that because... I, I do think that's a struggle for people. They listen to a guru and they think, well, I'm supposed to do that because the guru's telling them to, and I'm supposed to, you know, fill in the blank. And then they can't, or they struggle with it, or really the truth is it didn't apply to their industry. And, and it feels like they struggle for no reason. It's not simple. Honestly, entrepreneurship is not simple. That's why, I think there's a lot of focus right now on the successful businesses, the successful entrepreneurs, and people are not learning from the failures. 90-something percent of startups fail. Very smart people, capable people, great business ideas, a great team. They've sometimes got the money, and they still fail. And I think learning from those failures is really important. Um, and just listening to that advice from these success stories could be misleading. And um, if something's being mentioned again and again by influencers, like sit there DMing people on Instagram, a lot of people, a lot of these influencers are saying, hey, you need to, to engage with people, et cetera, and spend hours every day engaging with people. I'm not saying it's wrong. It could work for some businesses. I was actually giving a startup that advice a few weeks ago, but it wouldn't work for everyone. If you're someone building a course or a program, spending hours DMing people rather than building your program, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't apply to you. Instead, you should spend that time to build an incredible program that will bring value to others before you sit there DMing people about it. So it's a matter of timing. I think that's really important as well. Yeah, I, I think so too. I, I completely understand what you're talking about. And I feel so bad for those business owners who, with all the best intentions, listen to people and then go ahead and try and do these things. And then they think there's something wrong with themselves because they aren't able to do something that they probably shouldn't have been doing in the first place. It, look, it's, it is timing and there's different ways of doing things. I'll give you two examples, two people that and I've, I've got tremendous respect for everyone in this space, every entrepreneur, but I'll give you two names. You've got one, his name is Gary Vaynerchuk. Most people listen to him. And he always uh, tells people, you sit there, you DM people, you build relationships, you engage, you create content which works. And here I am doing it myself. I post a video a day on LinkedIn, but it took me many years before having the audacity or the time yeah. to do that. And then you've got another person, his name is Sam Ovens. He's a very smart entrepreneur. I've been watching his story for a long time and he built consulting.com, which is a program to help people get into the consulting space. And he's completely opposite to Gary Vee. He does not post a lot. He started doing more content now, but not even close to what Gary Vee does. He, he recommends a lot of the things that Gary Vee 
uh, disagrees with and vice versa. So who's doing the right thing? They're both made millions. They're both very successful. And that's why you've got to watch both of them and then read as much as you can, absorb as much information as you can from all these different businesses, but also look at where you are right now and what makes sense for your business at this particular time. Even something that worked for 90% of, let's say, consulting businesses. If you're a consulting business, if, if a certain marketing strategy worked or a certain biz dev strategy worked for 90% of other businesses in the industry, maybe it wouldn't work for you at this particular time. Maybe right now you need to sit back and work on the, on the product that you're selling. Or maybe you've perfected the product, just don't spend more time on it. Maybe now is the time to go to events and network. So it's a matter of timing whatever strategy whatever quote unquote hack that you've read about. Um, and that's not as, there's no formula for that. And that's why most businesses, as I mentioned earlier, do not succeed. 90 something percent fail. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that timing thing, thank you for that. I think that is um, critically important. Um, I, I want to talk about something a little different from timing and that's money or not having any of it. Um, will you share some of what the benefits are of like having no budget uh, when you're launching or growing a business? Wow, so many benefits and I learned those from my own experiences. There's one quote that I heard in some other interview a few months ago, scarcity breeds creativity. And it's absolutely true. I've, re I've, I've learned it a bit too late. I've <laughs> spent a lot of money when I shouldn't have. And that led to a lot of inefficiencies in my businesses when we were scaling. So what does it mean, scaling, uh, sorry, um, scarcity breeds creativity? What happens, you know, the human brain is a very funny machine. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just fascinating. And one thing the human brain does, when you give it a lot of something, it gets very complacent because it has everything it needs. But as soon as you take it away, so you take away resources from your team that don't have as many people to rely on, they'll find very creative ways to be, able to, um, to be able to achieve a certain task. Um, and it's just fascinating to see. We had, a, in one of my companies, we had over 100 people at one stage, well above 100 people. And then we had to scale back extremely rapidly to <laughs> 10 people. Such a massive, that was, that's when I got scammed in 2018. So it's a massive reaction that we had to, to take. And somehow, the 10 people, obviously the best of the best that stayed with the company, we kept them, never lose good talent because they're so difficult to find. Using different systems and processes and softwares and just smart strategies, they managed to achieve almost everything that was done by these 100 people that we did what we had back then. And it was just fascinating to watch that process. And it took, uh, took them a while to do that because we were all my companies were used to having a lot of resources. I would hire very quickly. And we were not used to not having enough people. But then my COO, his name is Roy. He's also my brother. He's opposite to me. He likes to be scarce. He likes to be frugal in his life. And he instilled that mentality into the company. I've given him credit for that. And he was the one leading that charge. And I would argue with him, which was great. Being my brother, he didn't mind arguing. And you need someone like that. I would argue. I'd say, you know, we, we need more people to be able to achieve this. Even the team is saying that. And Roy, Roy goes to me. He said, let me break it down. Let me go through the task and see exactly what needs to be done. And then he comes back with an explanation, Mario, I've gone through it. I know you probably haven't, Mario, because you don't like to go into the details. You're more of a strategy guy. I've gone through it and it's actually not that hard. And I've just found a software that can make the job 10 times easier. And um, I've created a system. So that's where the lack of money, the lack of resources instills a certain culture in your business that if you maintain it, you can cash up when things are really good rather than spend the money on continuously growing. That's terrific. I, I, it, it really does breed creativity and ingenuity. And um, yeah, I, I, that is, that, that's. Is it, look, great. humans, humans adapt. People adapt. Yeah. I've, uh, you've heard, you've read or heard or seen many movies where someone wasn't uh, just actually the audible book I was listening to before this. Um, was about um, part of the story is about someone who had a tremendous amount of money and then lost it all. And somehow he's, you know, his life adapts accordingly. When he had a lot of money, when I was doing extremely well, I was you know, traveling every minute, I was staying in hotels, I was living a very comfortable life. 
And then when things went bad, I adapted and my happiness level didn't drop. My lifestyle didn't change that drastically. I just naturally adapted because I'm forced to adapt. And it's the same thing with people that work in your company. When the circumstances change, whether voluntarily or you do, you force the circumstances to change because you want to change your culture. You, you cut down resources. You take away certain aspects in the business. You might have faced some resistance in the beginning, but over time, they're human. They will adapt. And um, that gets instilled into the culture over time. And now it's part of our culture after that event last year. We're very, we're, I wouldn't say frugal, but we're very um, efficient or more efficient than we were before. And do you find that everyone thinks along those lines? They look for efficiencies? It takes time and not everyone um, will will adapt accordingly. Many people will just, because be, dealing with less resources increases the stress, at least in the short term. Yeah. And um, what happened is some people just could not um, deal with that stress and, and they just said, look, guys, we just cannot do it. Uh, but that was a small percentage of people. And that's not a bad thing. You no, know, not everyone's going to fit your culture. Um, and others yeah. thrive under those circumstances. They liked that oh. challenge. And those are, um, those are keepers. Okay. Those are keepers. So am I hearing you correctly that, that, of the the people who remain, do they are are they now more likely to think along the lines of um, efficiency and doing more with less, or is it situational? So what you mean is the people that stay within the company are the ones that have the approach of doing more with less. Is that the question? Or it just depends on the situation of the company. Sometimes they do. I think if that's the question, it depends yeah. on the stage of the company. So if we're going through a stage where, again, that's where it goes back to timing, what we mentioned earlier. If, like, if my company is going through a period of, of market slowdown, it's completely out of our control. My competitors, one of my businesses is in the blockchain space. Uh, you probably heard about Bitcoin, but blockchain is the technology behind it. And there was a lot of hype back in 2018. And we were scaling very rapidly, hiring a person a day. A lot of our competitors were scaling quickly as well. And then the market dropped. Luckily, I was in business long enough to know that market forces always win. doesn't matter if you're Amazon or if you're a startup. Amazon almost you know, went out of business after the dot-com bubble burst. So... I immediately responded very, very quickly, took the hard decisions and cut down resources very rapidly. And then the team adapted pretty quickly on that situation. We were in a frugal situation. We had to be. Um, other competitors did not do that. And they kept the same mentality of scaling and things will get better. We just got to go through these hard times. And they did not react. Um, so it, it is situational in which you deal with the current circumstances in your business and in the market. And then when we scale again, like one of my other businesses went through a similar uh, event about two years ago, two and a half years ago, and now it's scaling. Um, and then even though we will start scaling again, we will have more resources, the efficiency ingrained into our culture, thanks to Roy, will still be there because you've got to be efficient even when yeah. you're scaling. It just improves your margins, improves your competi competitivity, competitiveness. Uh, uh, relative to your competitors. So I think being efficient okay. should always be there. Yeah, I d thank you for that. Th that. That's exactly what I was um, wondering about. So <clears throat> you're talking about your competitors and th there's something um, it, that I found interesting when I was getting ready for this. And it's um, something you called, you call um, building moats, which I guess are competitive mm. edges around your business. Yes. Can you expand on that? Absolutely. I wanted to mention it earlier, but I'm like, Mario, don't digress. You do this too much. But you're asking the right questions. I think one of the moats, so I got the word moat many, many years ago from Warren Buffett. And one of the moats, because he looks an incredible investor, very smart man, and he looks for businesses that have very strong moats, so competitive edges. Um, and th there are many things that gives you, give you a competitive edge. Efficiency is one of them. If you're efficient, your competitor is not, your competitor is doing, let's say this, all else being equal, you're both doing the same thing, so everything's equal, but your, your costs are 10% less than him. That means you can afford to pay more to acquire each customer, right? Because your costs are less. And when you can yeah. afford more to pay 
to acquire a customer on Facebook and Google, for example, that, that gives you, that's an immense advantage. That means you can outbid them for all the ads. And that could literally destroy their business. That one competitive edge, now business is a lot more complex because you might have an edge in one area of your business that could beat you in, in another area. But the more moats you build, the, the stronger, the, the, that's how you win in business. It's that simple. Now, what are some of these moats that you can build in a business? One of them is efficiency, is lower costs. Again, allows you to, first, it allows you to, to save up money, cash, for when you want to expand. And secondly, it allows you to, pay, to spend more to acquire customers, which is long-term growth, assuming you have lifetime value, which, which you should. So that's number one, the, the being efficient. Number two is the systems you have, which is linked to efficiency. When a company is systemized, it allows you to focus on other areas of the business. It reduces the dependency on, human, on the human brain because people will make mistakes. We're not perfect. Human, humanity is not perfect. So the more you systemize things, you can spot errors in advance. People rely on systems. You lose someone who's really smart. You bring someone else who can immediately take over his role. A systemized business can scale, and that's an incredible advantage over competitors. And it usually leads to efficiency and the ability to scale rapidly. So those are two things, like lower costs, better systems, two great uh, competitive edges. A third one, which is one I'm focusing on not right now, and an incredibly powerful one. I'd say this is the competitive edge for 2019, 2020. Um, and the way I know that is I look at all successful businesses, not gurus and experts. I actually watch the businesses that are growing very rapidly. I listen to any interviews they do and the strategies they use. One thing in common, and that's what you should do. You should listen to many people that are smart and find things in common. One thing in common with those businesses is they're obsessed with their consumer. It's not acquiring a customer is getting more and more expensive. So what's happening now is that businesses are realizing that and investing their time and money has been happening for a while in their existing customer base to increase that lifetime value of the customer, which I mentioned earlier. And the, the, the higher your lifetime value for every customer, obviously the higher the revenue, but also, again, the more you can spend on advertising. And there's a quote, I don't know who said it, essentially business is very simple and it's marketing. The person that can spend the most to acquire customers across all competitors wins, which makes sense. If I can spend $100 per acquisition, my competitor can spend $50. That means I can literally take, take over all their business because I can overspend, outspend them. And the best way to do that is to increase the revenue per customer. How do you do that? Well, one is you treat them really well, so they keep buying from you. Let's say you have one product to buy, like a, a kitchen appliance. One of my companies, two of my companies sell kitchen appliances. Well, what other auxiliary products can you have? Can you sell food products? Can you sell cooking guides? Can you sell other kitchen appliances? And the more revenue sources you have and the better you treat that customer, um, that's how you win. And that's my focus this year, and it's, it's turning out pretty, pretty well for me. Yeah, it sounds like it. Um, I'm going to take a quick sponsor break, and then I have some more questions for you. <clears throat> Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital, audio entertainment, and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. And if you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are Breathe to Succeed by Sandy Abrams and Leading Loyalty by Lena Renee. So visit audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, explore the books that are of interest to you, and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today we're speaking with Mario Knopfel about how to survive the ups and downs of entrepreneurship. So Mario, um, a couple minutes ago you mentioned um, Amazon, and I, I want to revisit it um, because I think it's important. I, I hear so many people talk about Amazon this and Amazon that, and can small business really survive Amazon? And so I'm wondering if you can weigh in on this and, and help the listeners understand 
how small business can not only survive but can thrive in this age of Amazon. Yeah, for businesses, why would they have the mindset of surviving? Businesses that had the mindset of surviving back during the internet, uh, when the internet came about, they did not see the internet as an opportunity. They saw it as a threat. Well, that's not what Amazon is, even though you could look at it as such and it makes sense to do so. You should look at, look at it as an opportunity. That's what I did. I looked at Amazon as an opportunity for us to enter the US market. You know, opening a website and competing is very expensive, very difficult. So we used Amazon. We tried to be, uh, well, actually we didn't, do it early enough, but we try to get onto Amazon early on. Now, if you're in a business, um, you know, you're selling everything on Shopify, you've been doing a word, or cool, let's say WordPress, um, and you're doing really well, and then Amazon's starting to take over your business. Well, it's the same thing as a brick and mortar store that was doing really well, and then the internet started taking over his business. What do you do? You adapt and you look at it as an opportunity. Um, back in the 90s, you open a website. Right now, open a store on Amazon. I'm not saying that's the answer, though. Like, I, like we said early on, there isn't a clear answer for everything. It depends on your business and what you're trying to do. Because I've read stories of businesses that decided not to go on Amazon and instead create a niche and being off Amazon, having their own followers, could work for them. It's been less and less common, and I'd like your feedback as well, Diane, because you see, I'm sure you speak to a lot of businesses. And it's something I look at all the time. And I, I used to weigh both options should we embrace amazon or should we you know stand out and while everyone is embracing amazon we should be the ones that do things differently and and sell outside of amazon then i realized beating amazon is just like trying to succeed without embracing amazon is like trying to succeed without embracing the internet it's possible i'm sure you'll find success stories but if you look at the metrics a lot more businesses made significant, a lot more money embracing Amazon rather than um, uh, trying to build their business without Amazon. So if you're an e-commerce business, I look at where the, where the success stories are. I'm sure you can find a lot more success stories of people starting business on Amazon and making millions um, and compared to, and it's going to be very hard to find businesses, even though they'll probably get the press presses attention that will succeed without Amazon. It's possible, but I definitely think it's really difficult. And Amazon should be seen as a great opportunity. And it's all about, look, in business, it's about having your eggs in as many baskets as possible. Even though focus is important, if you put all your eggs in one basket, it's obviously risky. So if you only depend on Amazon, um, Amazon literally controls your, your, your business in many ways. Um, and that's why you should have Amazon as one source of revenue. You should have your website is another source of revenue. You should have social media. You should have Instagram. You should have influencer marketing. Um, and they're all, they're all, for me, I look at them all as opportunities and try to make the most out of each of them rather than seeing them as threats. I think that's really the most important part. I think people spend so much time being upset and worrying what they, when what they could be doing is looking at it and saying, okay, what can I do with this? What how can I differentiate myself, you know, build my moats? How can I offer something? Is there something I can offer that Amazon cannot offer to my marketplace? You know, that, that getting creative is, has real value and we get to choose where we spend our energy and our brain power. I think, I think so. Look, if, if you look at the businesses that decided not to embrace Amazon, just one question I would ask myself is um, there's people that only buy from Amazon and more and more people are doing that and they wouldn't even look outside of Amazon. If you don't list on Amazon, you literally, and I'm assuming that that's one extreme, if you don't list on Amazon, you'll miss such a massive percentage of the population. But there's no one that would buy from your website but will say, hey, I'm not going to buy from you if you're on Amazon. If they went on your website, they'll buy from it. They're not going to decide not to buy if you're on Amazon. So going on Amazon, the risk is very low. The losses, that you know, not going to lose business, but it, you could gain a lot of business. Um, so yeah, I would definitely look at Amazon as an incredible opportunity. It's just the market evolving. And every time there's something new, like right now there's some social media platform called TikTok, even though I don't use social media. I still don't, I'm not too clear on what it is, but I would, or oh, there's live streaming. LinkedIn just launched 
the live streaming yeah. function, live videos right. um, for a small beta group. So I would immediately look that as an look at that as an opportunity and try to leverage it early on. Maybe it would fail, but if it does succeed and you're an early adopter, the return is uh, tremendous. Potential return is tremendous. Yeah, that's so funny. Um, I was just um, before before we were doing this, I was giving a presentation on social media and email marketing, and one of the guys said, um, "You know, with marketing, you just got to try something and pay attention to it and see what's working and what isn't working. But you got to be willing to try things." And I, I just remembered that when you were saying that because things are changing all the time and opportunities are there to connect and engage with your audience and, you know, set yourself apart if you're willing to look at it that way. That strategy of trying different things and doubling down on what works is not just marketing, it's business, even life really, but business right. in general. As an entrepreneur, you know, for any entrepreneur that says, what should I do? What's the strategy? How did you achieve success? Um, as Jim Collins eloquently puts it on his book, Good to Great, which I've listened to on, on your sponsor, Audible, he says, throw pebbles, as many pebbles as you can. And then when a pebble hits, you double down and you, and you throw that cannonball or you shoot that cannonball. So that's oh. what I do in business. I try many different businesses. And when one starts generating revenue, I don't care if it's profitable or not, it means it's an opportunity. And then I immediately put a lot of focus there to see if it can be scaled, if it can be profitable, et cetera. And it's the same with marketing channels. You try them all. Many will fail. Many like a Vine uh, did not succeed, no. even though a lot of people m built a brand using Vine and they're still doing yeah. well now. It did not succeed. But then Instagram, many people expected that not to succeed. But at the same time, some of the most successful brands right now built their brand on Instagram. So um, I definitely agree with trying different things and trying to be an early adopter. Because again, that allows, that gives you a competitive edge. We were talking about moats. If you're the business willing to jump on the next, um, um, I, I won't use the word trend, but the next opportunity um, and your competitors are ignoring it and just complacent with the way things are, that's an, an incredible long-term edge. Yeah. Now, what would you say to someone who, um, it wants to use a remote team, but is worried about being able to, you know, manage it effectively and, and not lose um, control over their business. Mm. I was asked this a few years ago, and um, the first time I was asked that question, and it caught me by surprise because I didn't even, I would read nothing about launching remote teams. When I started entrepreneurship, I didn't even know what entrepreneurship meant when I started my first business. Um, let alone remote teams. I haven't read the four hour work week or none of that stuff. And why did I have teams remotely? It just made sense. I, I, it just made logical sense. If I look for people in my, I was in Melbourne, Australia back then. And if I'm looking for people to employ within Melbourne, Australia, I'm sure there's a lot of talent. All I look at the entire world, the US, Canada, uh, the UK, etc. I'm just opening up my, opening up, a much bigger pool of talent to be able to leverage. Um, and, and, and so for me, it was just logical. Plus I was expanding to European countries and finding someone who's really great at customer service in Australia that speaks German or Dutch or, or, or French would not be easy. So obviously I had to hire in those countries. So the reason I got into hiring remotely is just, it just made, it made logical sense. Now, having done, it for, having done it for many years and most of my team is remote, some of my uh, team members I've worked with for years, um, I either never met or met once or twice. And they're senior team members. Um, by the way, we have an office in Australia and we have another office in the Middle East as well and another one in, uh, in the UK. So we do have offices, but most team members are remote. There are tools that allow, so if you're worried, they're not going to work. There's tools that can monitor their screen. I don't know what they're called. You can just Google them. Um, and that kind of takes care of the trust problem. Beyond that, I just don't see any other potential issue. Now, of course, working in the same office is, is good and uh, being able to see them, communication is easier. But at the same time, working remotely allows them to work in an office focus without interruptions. So a, a research shows a balance is, of both is good. If they only work remotely, they might miss 
seeing their colleagues, working with other people, that human interaction. And that's why many people like myself like to work in cafes. Uh, but at the same time, always coming to the office, it just, it, 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 that, that lack of variety apparently is not best for productivity. So I think a mix of both would work well. But if you're scared of hiring remotely, you're losing out because your competitor is not scared and he's going to have a competitive yeah. edge because he's willing to do that. Yeah, that's a good point. That's right. They have, you have to keep thinking about that. So, so. Um, you said something earlier about trusting employees and, and I think, you know, being hurt by that. Um, so, I, I, I'd like you to talk some about, you know, what does a business owner need to do or know or implement or whatever, so they can trust their employees. What, what's your, you know, give mm. us a, a lesson here. Systems. The more you depend on people, the higher the risk. Why? Because not everyone is a good person. And uh, people could be greedy. People can be inefficient. I'm, I'm just pointing out the negatives because that, that relates <laughs> to your point. Is why you yeah. should build systems. A, a system is... Um, is a system. It's, 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 it's a code on a computer. It's just going to do a certain thing and you don't expect it to be sick the next day or to change its mind or to find a better opportunity to make money somewhere else and, and leave without any notice or all these things that you know, managers will face. Now, I say this because I did not do a great job at that. And I'm talking about having remote team members that played a role in the scam I went through last year where team members actually scammed the company for months people i knew and, and the person that was leading it is someone i trusted on a personal level this will happen but i also know that if i was my weakness is trusting people if i trusted him less not in a bad way but to to make sure that everything he's doing is systemized and, and monitored I would not have gone through what i went through in 2018. now that is not an excuse to micromanage people which is not a great idea whatsoever. It's very inefficient. Um, so you got to try, and it's not an excuse to sit there doing everything, everything yourself because you're worried to give it to someone else because they could scab you. You're never going to scale a business. Business is risk. These things will happen. It's your job to mitigate that risk and building systems in your business. We talked about it earlier. is one of those competitive yeah. edges. So whenever someone comes or goes, um, they, the system will always be there. So if someone leaves without any notice, it's not going to be easy, but it's not going to be impossible either because everything in their brain is in your standard operating procedures and is in your project management tool. All their tasks are in the project management tool. Right now, if anyone in our company leaves, we can immediately replace them, immediately, uh, very easily. First, all their passwords are on LastPass. We block LastPass access. They don't have access to their passwords. I'm talking worst case scenario. It's very rare for this yeah. to happen. Emails, we got access to their emails. Their Skype account is a company account. And all the tasks they're doing, everything they're working on, is on a project management tool with a due date. So whoever comes in, takes over, can see all their tasks there. And we've gone through this, especially when we were scaling really fast. Last year, for example, we were hiring a person a day. You're, you're bound to hire bad apples, including the people that scammed me. That will happen. And the more you're systemized as a business, um, the less risk you're um you're susceptible to yeah i thank you i love this i i am a huge fan of systems and process and for the you know one of my reasons is exactly what you are talking about it gives you the opportunity to be unemotional about who is doing what and being able to monitor and confirm and, and i agree with you not by micromanaging just by knowing this is um, the way we do things. It's easy to jump on to, you know, there's standard operating procedures. We know what to expect. The person doing the work knows what to expect and what's expected of them. It just makes life so much easier. For everyone, exactly. For every, it's much, if, you're, yeah. if, you're, if you're being employed by a company and you come in and no one knows what's being done, you have to pick up the pieces from everywhere, that's inefficient and very stressful. If you come in yeah. and you can log into a project management tool and you see everything that the last person was doing with all the notes there, all the progress and the due dates, um, it doesn't need much explaining. Yeah, right. Right, absolutely.
Okay, I have one more question for you, and it is this. Based on research, what is the most important factor to consider when launching a business? Oh, that um, research has shown us really fascinating. Conscientiousness. Um, I, I still don't know how to spell it, and I misspell it sometimes. <laughs> but conscientiousness it really is a, fa- it's a complicated word. It's a, it's a fancy word for four things. I'll start with the least important to the most important. Number one is being organized. It's pretty logical, really. Being organized is really important in life and business, etc. And it's apparently a really important factor for success. The second one is being a perfectionist. While being a perfectionist has many downsides, such as sitting there working on a product forever before testing it in the market, and then when you test it in the market, no one wants to buy it, and you wasted all that time building it. So being a perfectionist, is, if not done right, it has its flaws. But at the same time, it, it is a very important factor for success. But it's one of the two least important factors. And it's true. When being a perfectionist, you make sure the system is perfect. You make sure the product is perfect. And that's, that's all advantages for your business, competitive edges, as we were saying, because your product is superior. Your system is superior. Um, and then the other two points, the most important points, are the first one, is working hard. You hear this all the time. And um, yeah. we mentioned Gary Vee, for example, him and, and talking about the hustle and working hard is one of his, the, the things he discusses the most. And it's true, you know, working hard gives you an edge. If you're working five hours a day um, and your competitor is working 10 hours a day, all else being equal, he's gonna double in size relative to you. Again, all else being equal. So working hard is really important. Um, and Mark Cuban uh, uh, said once, you know, he's always working because he knows some other punk is sitting there also working, trying to eat his lunch. The punk is the term he used. So there's always someone working hard trying to take his business and that gets him to always continue working. He likes that challenge. Now, working hard, I mentioned it before the last one because the last one is significantly more important and that's working smart. Because I work very hard. I'm obsessed with working. All I do is I, I work and I dance, I love dancing as well. So I know I work hard, but I know I'm not working hard compared to a lot of the people I see on a daily basis. Like a, a less, even a, a waiter at a restaurant that wakes up in the morning, goes, works in that restaurant, and then goes home, takes a half an hour break, then goes out and works in a bar for another few hours and gets three hours of sleep. I get eight hours of sleep. So I'm sure there's a lot more people listening to this podcast and um, living life, even not building their business that are working harder than me. And I'm sure other entrepreneurs are working harder than me, even though I work a lot. Why? And that's because working hard alone is definitely not enough for success. Working smart is what matters. Working hard doing the right thing at the right time. Because if you're working hard doing the wrong thing, but someone's working 10 times as much, focusing on the right thing, they will succeed. And that's where timing comes in. So if you sit there building YouTube, the next YouTube, for example, but you did it in 1995, like Bill Gross did, you will fail because the internet was too slow for YouTube to work. And then when you launch it in 1995, a perfect product, um, no one will use it because the internet is too slow. But then when YouTube launched by people that were not working as hard, I'm assuming, they uh, launched it at the right time, even though they started as a dating website but it was the right product at the right time and then doing the right things. If you're sitting there working hard as an entrepreneur, answering customer service calls or writing emails, replying to customers, and that's all you're doing, you wake up and that's all you're doing, you go to sleep, you're like, man, why can't I make $10 million or $5 million or $1 million? Why can't I get to that level? Well, because you're sitting there replying to emails rather than perfecting your product or building a system or developing a great marketing strategy. So even though you're working hard, you're not working hard on the right thing. And it sounds very simple uh, when, you, when, when listening to this, but it's really hard to implement. So when you wake up in the morning tomorrow and you're, you're starting work, building your business, just look at what you're doing throughout the day and just think about it. Is that actually creating value? Is that taking me a step ahead compared to my competitors? If something I do that's not take, that's not benefiting me or my business, I cannot do it or I'll be depressed. Personal and business. I cannot do something that's either improving me as a person or improving my business. And that obsession played a role in in where I am today. 
Yeah, thanks for that. I I um I so get it. I think it's really valuable information for people to hear. And on some level I think they probably know it, but as we were talking about before, there's so many people out there telling them what they should be doing that sometimes they forget uh to really, you know, just break it down and and make it a little easier on themselves, you know, that it really isn't, doesn't have to be hard. So thank you for this, Mario. I, I really appreciate um, the time and the information. And I'm wondering if you uh, can share with the listeners, um, you know, what you're working on, what's going on, how they can find you, that kind of thing, please. Sure. Look, the only thing I'd share is I'm posting a lot of material now, videos, etc. Um, and I started doing it since I got scammed. So when I got scammed, I opened LinkedIn, I opened Instagram, etc. I realized that having a name helps. When I was scammed, even people in my company didn't know I existed because I was very, very private, only working with management, making decisions. And since then, I've really gone, when I'm obsessed over something, I go all the way. And I'm obsessed in creating content. So if you go on my YouTube, for example, I've got a lot of videos not only talking about generic things like a lot of people, but I actually filmed myself running my businesses, making decisions, going through ups and downs, losing money, making money. So if that brings value to anyone in the audience, they can go on my website, marionorfall.com. Norfall is N for Nelly, A for Alpha, W for Whiskey, F for Fred, A for Alpha, L for Larry. I wish I changed my last name when I was young because I don't need to spell it out every time. <laughs> but that actually brings and that you can find a lot of content there that I hope brings people in, and I've actually found I'm enjoying the process of um, giving value. It's actually pretty fulfilling. It is fun, isn't it? That's really it's great. crazy, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And listeners, thank you. I think this was a great um opportunity to hear someone who's been there like you and had some of those experiences, isn't afraid to share them uh, because what you're really hearing is uh, lessons learned. And so, you know, you can benefit from that. So uh, th this is really tremendous. Uh, and I would like to thank our sponsor, audible.com. To get a free trial of audible.com and a free audio book, go to audibletrial.com slash business growth to sign up. As always, continue to prosper and be curious and until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Spark innovation across your federal agency with IT hardware, software, and services from Connection Public Sector Solutions. Your technology procurement challenges will meet their match as Connection's dedicated account managers offer exceptional customer service and our extensive list of supported federal contracts means you'll always get a price that works for your budget. Learn more about innovation for your agency with Connection Public Sector Solutions at connection.com slash fedcontracts. I asked my doctor to write a note saying I suffer from cabin fever so I could write off my summer vacation as a medical expense. She said no. Fortunately, Red Roof's clean, comfortable rooms are very affordable and you wake up rested and ready to hit the road again. And get this, when you rest and repeat at Red Roof this summer, staying two separate times can earn you a free night. Cure your cabin fever at redroof.com. Great careers are forged out of great relationships. Your success, whatever your field, relies and thrives on the support and insights of others. I'm Andy Lapata, an author and speaker on the power of professional relationships. In the Connected Leadership podcast, I have the privilege of interviewing people from around the world to understand the relationships that have made a difference on their journey and how their insights can help you. From Nobel Prize winners to Olympians, from NASA astronauts to peace campaigners, my guests have shared some captivating moments from their lives and careers. Combined with experts from leading universities, cutting-edge authors and giants of business, the Connected Leadership Podcast aims to inspire, educate and entertain.